Hello and welcome to Gamer's Tavern. This is episode 8. I am Ross Watson. And I'm Daryl Mott Jr. And joining us tonight at the table in the corner is Nicole Wakelin. Hey, everybody. So, Nicole, uh, one thing we ask all our guests to join us on the Gamer's Tavern, what is your gamer's character sheet like? Well, I have a little segment on the D6 Generation podcast that a lot of gamers know me from. And I have my own blog where I talk about games and anything else that amuses me called Total Fangirl. And I also write for Geek Mom and Nerd Approved. And you'll see me talking about all sorts of geeky, gamery stuff over there as well. Yes, the D6 Generation, a, a small, maybe little-known podcast that uh, sort of exists in the, in the corner of the industry over there. Yeah, a wee tiny <laughs> little thing. <laughs> <laughs> So, you may no, or may I'm not, not know quite about them. familiar with them. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, D6 Generation is, is a fantastic podcast. I hope someday we can be as awesome as them. Uh, and we're really, Every other week it gets me through my work day. It don't does don't be telling them that because their heads are big enough already. The guys don't need to hear you talking about <laughs> <that>, okay? <laughs> well, th- thank you for joining us tonight, Nicole. Um, we're really glad to have you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited. It'll be fun. Our topic tonight is actually going to be about uh, gaming with the family and and intro games. And we thought that you would be a really great guest for that. Because if I remember correctly, you've actually talked about this before on Total Fangirl. I have, because we have two kids. They're 9 and 11 now. So being that we both play games, as soon as they were old enough to know not to bite the heads off of meeples, we started getting them into games. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, don't destroy the game pieces, please. No, when they try to chew in the game pieces, they're not ready yet. (laughs) Right. <laughs> and we also thought it was a good topic considering the holiday season's coming up. So a lot of people might be spending time with the extended family. And uh, from my day job, I know that a lot of families, they get bored after the turkey is done and end up going to the casino. I figured that uh, helping people do a little bit of tabletop gaming might be a little bit more of a bonding experience than staring at a slot machine. Yeah, we actually do that. Most uh, most holidays when we get together, at some point, games get broken out, and we'll have the kids playing games and us, and then sometimes we break out and play our own games. So it's a big holiday thing for us. That's awesome. I actually wish my family played more games. Um, I managed to get my dad to uh, roleplay with me a couple times last year, uh, or year before last, actually. <laughs> See, so it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think I've actually talked about this before on the show, uh, so I won't get too into detail about that, but um, it was really fun uh, gaming with my dad, and I would... Uh, I would love to do some more games with my family, but uh, it's it's just really hard because, well, one of my dad's out in the oil field uh, most of the time, and he only comes home every three weeks or so. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's, hard, it's really hard to schedule, you know. <laughs> yeah, during his brief stint when he's not doing the oil thing. Exactly. So, Daryl, do you do you game with your family? Uh, I did when I was a kid, and I really, really miss it. It was one of my oh, always one of my fondest memories of the holidays is after the darkies done, uh, all the grumpy, curmudgeon men would go watch football. <laughs> Which, it was college football. I was a kid. I was an Oilers fan. Which explains why I watch soccer as an adult. Oh. Because I grew up an Oilers fan. Well, before we <laughs> but, get... Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah football. Ugh. <laughs> it's, that, that and holidays <laughs> go hand in hand. Uh-huh. This is to say, before we get too far into this, actually, we should... Um, we were trying to work in some new segments to our, our program. And as you can tell, we're not completely uh, uh, on top of this podcasting thing quite yet. So... <laughs> Uh, one thing we wanted to do is we wanted to set aside a little time and just kind of talk about what we've been playing lately. Uh, so, game time, uh, Total Fangirl, what have you been playing lately? What have I been playing lately? Um, actually, the last game that I played was a quick game. It was just Zombie Dice, um, which I know is not the most exciting, thrilling, amazing, complex game, but when you don't have a lot of time, it's a fun game to play, and I was playing with the kids. So, that's a fun one to play for me. Awesome, and it it fits the uh, the gaming with family theme absolutely. It does, and it's well, you know, because trying to fit things in, I travel a lot, so I don't always have a lot of time to sit down and play for a long period of time. I've done a lot of traveling lately, so I wanted to find something I just hang out with the girls and play quick and dirty, and that's one of those kinds of games. Awesome, and Daryl, what have you been playing lately? I've been having to actually make time for gaming at this point. I've been a little bit busy right now, but I have been uh, breaking out. Uh, if you've read my, by the time this airs the anical news column where i review it'll be up i've been playing dead panic which is the new version of castle panic but it's zombie themed instead of fantasy themed it's kind of a tower defense game fight off the hordes it's really really interesting they added a lot of cool new mechanics and i'm probably going to talk about it a little bit later in the show as well and of course you can read my full review on anical news fantastic as for me well <laughs> i've actually been uh 
kind of been playing a lot of Borderlands 2 lately on my Xbox 360, but that doesn't really count. Um, every weekend, though, we do get together, and we've been playing um, Accursed. We've been playing Savage Worlds. And it's really been neat exploring the world of Accursed because I've kind of been um, intentionally taking my players to areas of the setting that we haven't really fully defined yet to sort of challenge myself to try and come up with something, you know, to help sort of flesh out exactly, you know, uh, every little piece of that world. And it's, actually, it's really, really fun. I mean, I love the fact that people are playing in, in, in the setting that I created and everything, but it's also uh, Savage Worlds is turning out to be a surprisingly effective system for my particular approach to role-playing. And how's that been going? Have you gotten everybody to play with you? Or is this like a regular crew or people you're dragging in? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is my regular crew. Um, we, have, we, we are still kind of uh, recruiting because we had a couple of people that moved to... Uh, Las Vegas, and we're trying to, you know, kind of get our group back up to the, the full amount of numbers. Um, but we did have a, a good old friend of mine from um, Maryland come into Austin, um, Monty St. John. He's one of the guys who owns the Arduin RPG. And uh, Monty and his wife Josie have been playing with us for the last few weeks, and uh, we think that they are great great people, and they're a great addition to our group. Nice. Um, so that's that's going really well. Um, I'm excited about that. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can actually... Um, the next thing I'm on my plate after we get done playing some Accursed, I, I want to do you know a good full campaign of that. But after that, I think I'm kind of interested in doing some um, some good old fashioned White Wolf and maybe do, bring out the uh, the Werewolf game, uh, the Werewolf, Werewolf the Apocalypse uh, role playing game. And that's due to uh, Daryl and I talking to Ari, Ari Marmel a few episodes <laughs> ago where we covered in depth all of the uh, White Wolf games, and I kind of got on onto that. So dust that one off and break it out again. Yeah, well, the 20th anniversary edition came out not so long ago. Uh, I want to say like four or five months ago. And did Although you get that, that immediately? Long. Is that when you have the 20th anniversary edition? Yeah, I have it because I'm a big fan of that game, and uh, <laughs> it, it's very, very cool. So, but that's um, that's really not something I could play with my family. Uh, that's a little, I think, probably advanced. Mm-hmm. Like with, with <laughs> when I had my dad, uh, we played um, Feng Shui, which is a very nice, simple, action-packed role-playing game. And I think my dad would probably really get into Savage Worlds. But something like Werewolf is, is fairly, I don't want to say dense, because the rules are not super complex, but it is a very theme-heavy game. There's just an awful lot of stuff to absorb. You, know? you can't just say, I'm playing a guy who is a former drug dealer, and go. Like you could do in Feng Shui. Right. Well, <laughs> that's know? the challenge of some of those themed games, and they come up with a really great universe and a great environment. But if you don't already know that environment or really like it, then it's like, I don't know how to do the werewolf thing. That's not what I'm into, and it's tough for new players. Now, the werewolf, of course, the party game is a different story. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. my God. Uh, that's You know, we broke that out at one of my daughter's birthday parties, Rusted, as a fun thing, like let's try to get them all to play. They started playing that. The kids now ask for that. Randomly, kids gathered in my house, they want to play that game. Werewolf can work with new players or any sort of really, really heavy campaign setting thing, like even Shadowrun or Vampire or any of those. Can work with a new player, but you can't really run it as like a one-off, one-shot like that because it's all about discovering and exploring the world in that case. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've talked about gaming with family. We've talked about, you know, how we're looking forward to doing it or how we're already doing it. Here's a question I think I want to throw out there to both Nicole and Daryl. Why should you game with your family? What are, the, what are the pros and cons of gaming with your family? Oh my gosh, it's such a very long list of pros and such a very short list of cons. Um, <laughs> Let me least... pick the top two then. <laughs> <laughs> my top two pros because when you sit down and you play games with your family, when you find a fun game, you stop for a minute being mom and dad and brother and sister and you're just people having fun and enjoying each other's company and it forces you to just just engage each other in a way that you wouldn't necessarily normally and it's fun sort of like almost like your barriers come down you get so into the game you're playing you just have a good time with it and I think it it makes you connect in ways that you wouldn't normally so you're saying you step out of your normal family roles I think you do to a degree I mean when you're you know as a parent, you're still saying, okay, I'm not going to let my kids, you know, wallop each other over the table over who's right and who's wrong over a certain rule. But when you're all sort of, it's all sort of leveled out. You're all players. You all have to play by the same rules. I'm not more important or have more power just because I'm mom. You know, my, my nine-year-old has just as much power as I do. So suddenly she can wield that against you and it's kind of fun for them, you know, and you can't, you can't take charge because the game won't just say these are the rules for mom, you know? Right. 
So kids can win, and that's that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Because when I mean, kids love it when they when they best their parents. I don't think there's anything sweeter for a kid than managing that. <laughs> <laughs> and and what are what are some of the cons? Maybe the cons. Uh, my con is is maybe it's a pro that's turned into a con when your kids are so into a game, especially a campaign or something like that. They can go until you finally make them stop it's hard to make them stop like it almost can suck up too much of their time and then you feel a little bad saying look i've been we've been playing for three and a half hours and you know there's other stuff we all need to do and get that sort of like oh kind of moment that's that's a con (laughs) Mm, okay what about you daryl what um what do you think well uh, most of my extended family's actually grown up i was the i'm actually in between generations in my family my uh most of my extended family had their all the ones that are the same age as my parents had their kids when they were in their 20s and I didn't come around until my parents were almost in their 30s so I'm about five to ten years younger than my youngest cousin but I'm like five or ten years older than my oldest cousin so it kind of puts me in the middle there but like you said if we sit down around a game table that kind of goes away and also it gives us a point of focus of social interaction where I really couldn't care less about Amazing Race. I really couldn't care less about how the Cowboys are doing. I really couldn't care less about, did you see Real Housewives? Blah, blah. (laughs) I I don't care. But that's what they want to talk about. They want to talk about Tyler Perry movies because those are hilarious. And I'm just like, please, can we change the subject? (laughs) Let's talk about a game. Or... Or when the dreaded, you know, politics comes up. So that's when you've got that board in between you that gives you something to talk about that doesn't, that's universal. Everyone can get into the game. Everyone can talk. You can talk about your lives. You can socialize. But you have that focal point to bring everything back to. So it's like a a, sort of a neutral ground for social interaction with your family where you might otherwise have some conflict. Exactly. Okay, that's a really good point. And I, I definitely agree with both of you. Um, like like Nicole, I think I found that uh, you know gaming with my dad really brought us to some really interesting uh, places as far as having some common ground, and and I learn I like to say that you can learn a lot about people from the the type of characters that they role play and from the the way that they you know interact with with the game at the table, especially in a group. And I'd never seen my dad in that situation before, and uh, I got to play two different games with him at two different times, and both times I, f- I found myself just saying, wow, you know, first of all, he's really good, and second of all, you know, wow, I, I never thought he would make those decisions that he's making now, you know, it, w- it surprised me. I like the fact that you could still surprise me about my dad, you know, after you know, 38 years. So <laughs> I think that's great. So yeah, I, I definitely agree with both of you guys. I think we have some very good points about it. I guess for me, like the only con is, is just you know, with with family, if if gaming is not their first priority, uh, it can be a difficult conversation to get started with them as far as trying to schedule a time to do it. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, we have. I mean, it's gaming. At least in our household, has always been a big part of it. So you know, in our little the four of us here, we always find time to game. And in fact, I, you know, it's, it's almost every spare moment they want to game. And sometimes you, you, like I said, you just have to back off. But with our extended family, I'm fortunate in that Russ's brother is also a gamer. His kids like to game. So we can easily get together with those families. And even if we plan to get together to do something non-gaming related, inevitably, if we end up at one person's house or the other, it's like, well, hey, you know what? Want to break out this game? Want to break out that game? Uh, so it's it's kind of nice. Although we have had those situations where sort of like the next generation up, like our parents and grandparents, they aren't always into it, but they'll sort of hover over our shoulders and then they start rooting us on like they they don't want to play i don't want to play no i'm not into playing and then suddenly they, they're standing there saying do this do that do the other thing We're like, i thought you didn't want to play <laughs> you know <laughs> well, one, one other thing about gaming with your family at least uh, for me you know i really enjoy you know when families get together for for things especially like holidays and whatnot i really enjoy that time where we are together and we are interacting with each other what i don't really enjoy so much and this is just my personal you know your mileage may vary thing but what I don't enjoy so much is when the focus is, is on something like a football game on television or if everyone's absorbed in their phones. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it just it does, it feels like we had an excuse to get together, but we didn't really take advantage of it, you know. And uh, that's the thing about a game is I feel like that's a great 
thing to do when you want to facilitate that interaction to take advantage of the opportunity that the holidays provide for you is to to get them into that social interaction via the game. Yeah, we've even done, and I remember doing this, gosh, when I was in high school, that Russ's mom, back when we were dating, used to do silly games where you'd like pin the name of somebody on the back of someone's shirt and you'd have to ask questions to figure out what was pinned to the back of your shirt, which, <laughs> and you'd be asked, you know, are they alive? Are they dead? Is it, you know, all these different questions. And it was kind of funny because I didn't really know his family. It was when we were first dating, but it forced me to interact with everybody and kind of get to know everyone. So it really is like any kind of game is that ultimate icebreaker in a family and forcing everyone to just relax and kind of enjoy each other and have fun. And you get kind of absorbed in things and it, it, it creates an interaction that, like you said, wouldn't be there if you all just came in, sat down, grabbed a drink, and started staring at your telephones. <laughs> uh, which is an unfortunate reality for a lot of families these days. Mm-hmm. We all, we've talked about you know gaming with the family and, and, and why that's a good thing. Let's talk about how you would pick the game that you want to present. What are the criteria? Uh, let's start with you, Daryl. What are the criteria for you when you pick a game that you would want to play uh, with your family for the holidays? It depends on a lot of different factors, but it, it also depends on which segment of the family. you got to take into consideration who's going to be around the table. Like I said, I've got a younger cousin who's about five years younger than me. Uh, she has a young child. So if she sees mommy and daddy playing a game, she's going to want to jump in. And so I have to make sure that if she's running around, whatever theme the game has is appropriate for her age group. So I can't break out Cards Against Humanity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Cards Against Humanity, yeah, not, not kid-friendly. Now, once the kids go to bed, that's a different story. Except for Cards Against Humanity, you tend to get a little bit loud. So I'm not, still not sure if I'd recommend that one, even for the adults. But it, it's one of those things you really have to look at that. You have to look at the theme. You have to look at the mechanics. You have to, especially if you're if they're not gamers particularly if they're just doing it as a way to be social and hang out on the holidays you really have to make sure that it's you're not going to break out twilight imperium to play with <laughs> family members who don't play the game for what? God's sake. I'm shocked. so <laughs> five hours long <laughs> <laughs> link least. that link the length is another thing you have to consider because if you look at a game like castle panic or dead panic those are really really good really introductory the rules are really simple Really fast to learn. It's a lot of fun, but that game can go two hours. You know, I'm going to throw something else into this mix. Um, I think you got a lot of good points there. And when you're talking about, you know, complexity and, and game length and things like that, you also want to take into consideration the setup time. And not just the setup time, but, like, the amount of components. I mean, Nicole brought up a really, a really great point earlier about not letting your kids eat the meeples, right? <laughs> so if you can find a game that has maybe not a crazy ton of components and, and like the one of the games that comes to my mind right away is uh Horus Heresy or uh Axis and Allies thing there's just there's games that have like like just tons and tons of chits or and, and components maybe even something like Descent you know there's just a lot of components in that game and if I'm going to be playing at a table with a lot of people especially if some of them are are, are children I think I would have some concerns if I had a game that had just just a ton and ton of components because you're you're unlikely to get them all back at the end of the night. And that's important with a lot of games like Ticket to Ride, which is a great introductory game, but you lose one train piece, that set is kind of broken. You need all those train pieces. Uh, Small World, those little tokens. Now, that being said, I mean, it's not it's not you couldn't just sacrifice it for the cause, right? And then later on, <laughs> probably, you know, most companies these days, you can call and get a replacement very easily. Right. Through through customer service, so you know, don't don't take what I said as as you know this is you know, forbidding you. You should never do it, right? I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm saying you should just think about that. <laughs> is all I'm saying. You just got to worry about that first time. You got to take the kid in to get X-rayed to find the <laughs> ticket to ride train up their nose. <laughs> well, and you know, the, uh, true story. True story. The other thing too with the with having the very many pieces is aside from the fact that a kid might accidentally take one if they're too little and they're not paying attention, it takes a lot of the enjoyment out of it for you as an adult, whether you're the owner of a game or just one of the other adults playing. When you're thinking, I have to keep my kid's hands where I can see them because they might accidentally take one of these tokens. So not only is it, oh God, I've lost a train, but you've got adults saying, oh, we can't lose any trains. And it takes a lot of the fun out of it when you're that stressed about kids or just losing pieces. Right, and like a game that comes to mind immediately is uh, StarCraft. With all those cool little, you know, spaceships and stuff like that, I mean, I, if I was a kid, I would want to play with that. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would say, I'm going to take it from the table and maybe, you know, go into my room and play with my army man and, and you know, bomb him with the uh, the Zerg, you know. <laughs> so, and then it's going to fly behind the bed and I'm never going to see it again when I exactly. pick it across the room in a battle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, all I'm saying is it's something to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Oh, another thing about the pieces is you're saying this, you know, I remember we've broken out games where there's, there's a lot of pieces and sometimes for people even who are very willing to try to jump into a game, but might, might not think of themselves as gamers, but are like, okay, I'll give it a try. You guys seem enthusiastic. Show me how to play this game. It could be really easy, but if it has too many pieces, just the sight of those pieces all strewn about the table will turn people off. Yeah, and like intimidating. Yeah. Android is extremely intimidating. Right, to most you, people. you see all those pieces, or even those pieces, cards, tokens, whatever it is, and you think there is no way that I'm going to be able to figure this out, even if you know they could. So you have to be aware too that even from the point of view as other adults, too many pieces for a game that you don't know with a room full of people can be intimidating, and they're not going to enjoy it because they're going to be so concerned about looking like they don't know what they're doing. Right, that's a good point. So, what do you think is probably the ideal game length? for gaming with your family on the holidays? Nothing, nothing over two hours, probably, just because if, even if it's a game that is gripping for that length of time, if you start getting hitting up about that two-hour mark, that's when people are, okay, I'm ready to get another slice of pie, mm-hmm. I want to go check what the score is on the game, I want to go out for a cigarette, we need more beer, what, whatever it is that your family does, people are going to start losing attention at that point. They're going to want to start doing other things. Do you agree with that, Nicole? So. Yeah, I would say nothing more than two hours. And I was thinking exactly that because you sit down, you have your pie that you're eating, you have your drink that you're drinking. An hour later, an hour and a half later, you're thinking, I could really use another drink. I could really use another piece of pie. And, and people start to sort of fade, you know, especially if you had the big heavy meals that we all eat. We're all pigging out at the holidays, you know, how long, can you, <laughs> how much can oh, you keep your attention focused when you've had a, you know, a four pounds of turkey for dinner. So yeah, I would say like to me between one and two hours at the very highest end of that. See, this is one of those reasons I'm really glad Nicole came on the show tonight because while I've played a lot of board games and Daryl has probably played more than his fair share as well, I would dare say, Nicole, you are probably, of the three of us, the most experienced Uh with various (laughs) board games. So I'm really glad, you know, to have your expert opinion here. If if you could see the number of board games strewn about the room in which I'm recording, that would probably reinforce that idea. Oh, no doubt. No (laughs) doubt at all. Mine are all mine are all in a big giant duffel bag, except the ones I'm currently reviewing. I've I've got a shelf on my wall full of full of board games as well. So so I guess, you know, for for the the listeners and and because we have this expert on our show tonight, uh, what would you say is probably the ideal setup time for a game like if, if you're gonna think about running a game for your your family what what is the setup time you would aim for oh gosh you know what without picking an exact time i'd say as quick as you possibly can you know what we tend to do is we tend to set up games where something else is happening like the table has just managed to get cleared wherever we're playing the game we'll start setting it up while people are still finishing their dessert or whatever so that it's kind of as much as possible sitting there ready to go when everybody sits down and picks a color or picks a character uh because you the longer you spend setting it up the more you get to that People get intimidated by seeing it all there. They get distracted by the 15 other things happening around them. You know, they lose their focus. They're getting up for something. Uh, You don't want something that's going to take you, like, even 15, 20 minutes. That's a long time to set up a game and have people just waiting, like, is the game ready? Is the game ready? So upper limit would be 15 minutes. I would say no more than 15 minutes. If you're spending more than 15 minutes setting up a game for your family, unless they're hardcore gamers that you know are going to be totally tolerant of that, you're picking a game that's too complicated. That sounds completely reasonable to me, and I think 15 minutes is probably the most. I think I agree with that. If you can find a simple enough game you can uh, you can set up faster, like you said, do it when everyone else is doing their usual post-meal rituals, clearing off the dishes and putting them away, or going out for the cigarette, or t- rounding up the kids, or doing whatever. Set it up then while everyone else is busy doing other things so they're not sitting around waiting on you. Mm-hmm. But again, that 15-minute setup time is also a good rule of thumb for complexity as well. If a game takes more than 15 minutes to set up and it's not like some big like 3d scape thing that just looks awesome it just takes a lot of time because it looks so cool hero scape exactly well i'd even say that's a little bit too much for family maybe for the kids could pick it up a lot quicker it but is very impressive really depends looking. on the family 
that, exactly. that's the only thing I would put it, onto that is that, you know if you, you would you would get people interested just by saying behold <laughs> Heroescape <laughs> Mountain you know uh, but you're right you're right but it's it's also a good rule of thumb for complexity if you're spending more than 15 minutes setting up that game's going to have too many moving pieces for people to keep track of mm-hmm. that's a good point um, and which makes me think of of Mousetrap you know that old uh, Hasbro oh, um, I remember that game <laughs> and actually you know they did a good job with making it feel complex without it actually being that complex. No, it really And setup wasn't. was actually pretty easy. So we've talked about, you know, the mechanics of the game and things like that. What about theme? What are some things you would want to think ahead about when you're looking at games and you're looking at the theme of the game as far as, you know, gaming with your family? Well, I know for me, well, where we have normally anywhere between four and five kids at most of the things that we show up with, I try to pick things that are not going to be overly spooky, uh, which sounds silly, but, you know, sometimes the weirdest piece of graphics on a card will suddenly give a kid nightmares for a month. Uh, So I try to pick games that have a little bit more fun, a little bit more cartoony kind of graphics going on, um, and themes that aren't particularly dark, like uh, Zombicide was a little much for my kids. Like, that was too much, even though they're like, you know, like the 11-year-olds are kind of like, this is too much and you just don't know so and even adults sometimes don't want to see scary stuff or vampires or werewolves you know that you have to watch that theme and make sure it's not too in your face or too scary or intense for a lot of your players well it's not just theme though it's tone right i mean mm-hmm. you, you said zombie side is too much but zombie dice right because that's goofy i mean that and that's yeah, yeah and there's no you know there's just these it, and the kids are making zombie noises you know and you had like brains and, and that kind of stuff yeah when you make it light and fun and you change the tone to being sort of silly and comical and cartoonish right. they're totally fine but as soon as you make it real and blood and guts and oh my gosh someone's dying then it can get then it can get too intense and then it can be scary and then no one's having fun that's a good point what about you daryl what were you going to say pretty much exactly what nicole just said but i was also going to bring up you want something that has a little bit more of a universal appeal because sure most gamers typically tend toward the geek spectrum some way shape or form so you break out munchkin they're not going to get any of the jokes Mm -hmm. munchkin pirate or something like that sure they might get that because it's a little bit more of a universal theme uh that's just the first example that popped in my head but you want to go for something that's Zombies? Yeah, everyone knows zombies. Everyone's seen Night of the Living Dead or the newer zombie movie, Shaun of the Dead, or what happened 28 Days Later. Do vampires. Everyone everyone knows vampires. Uh, you can even do fantasy tropes. Most people have seen Lord of the Rings by now. But if you try to pull out something that has like this really esoteric thing, you try to pull out something like Smash Up, they may not get a lot of the joke references in there. Or uh, I've got a copy of Star Flux. I would never bring that out for my family because they would never understand all the little jokey references in it. So you're talking about you're, you're talking about making sure that it's appropriate to the geek level of your family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, m- making sh- making sure that the audience that you're playing with can right. get why the game's fun because a lot of the, a lot of the games that are lighter and goofier in tone also tend to be a lot more uh, humorous and light fluffy in tone so if you can't get the joke then it loses a lot of that appeal that's where a lot of the fun comes in is from the humor mm-hmm. okay that's a good point like for example we were just we're kind of kind of going back to zombies quite a bit here but i think that's you know a, a good universal place a to third, start anyway. about a third of the board games out there are zombie games at this point oh, I think. right yeah zombies well, are big <laughs> So let me just uh, let me just take you through a couple of levels of this as far as what I'm seeing. Like we're seeing Zombie Dice, it has uh, the right tone for family. It has the right complexity. It has the right number of mechanics. It has you know setup time and play time are all you know basically perfect, right? It's, it's setup short... time is about thirty seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Play time is about yeah. five to ten minutes. <laughs> now the theme, the, the, the theme and tone of, of Zombie Dice. I mean that's the only thing I think might give you know maybe maybe a very you know, maybe an older person who's very, very conservative might be like, why are you letting your kids play with zombies? But that's like the only thing I can see, you know, even even being an issue, right? Now, you take that and you graduate it up to something like Nicole was saying, like Zombie Side, or you graduate it up to, uh, you know, there's there's some board games out that are... Zombies! Uh, Sedition Wars, you know, like uh, something yeah. like very heavily into the miniature side. Or you talk about uh, Last Night on Earth. And now you're into much more adult territory. Now you're into much more complex games, much more longer setup, many, many more components. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Flying Frog is not known for having simple to set up games, for one thing. <laughs> I've got a copy of uh, Fortune and Glory 
it took me an hour and a half to set that up the first time. <laughs> there was so much crap in that game. I'm just saying these games all have very similar yeah. themes, but they actually have diff- way, you know, wildly different tones and, and wildly different other things that we've talked about today. And I just wanted to use them as sort of an example of like just how you can look at games that on the surface may appear similar, but they're very, very different. I think that's a good point because, you know, just because you think, okay, kids, I don't want to do zombies, so not the case. You know, zombie dice, totally fine for younger kids. Zombicide, maybe not. So, yeah, just because it's a certain genre or topic, there's so many games within each of those that there's likely something you can pick that pick that will be okay for your entire family as an audience that will be in any topic that you want to, you think they'll like. That's a very good point. Yeah, even last night, even last night on Earth isn't that dark and realistic because it plays everything like cheesy B movie. So there is a lightness to it that you can get away with. And there's not a lot of actual, as far as I recall, the last time I played, there's not a lot of actual blood and guts. There's some implied, but it's not actually there. So older kids might be able to get away with. That. I would, I would I'm say, talking about like 11, yeah. 12, 13. If, yeah. if you would let, if you would let them watch a horror movie, then the game's going to be fine. I would mm-hmm. say, Last Night on Earth is probably PG thirteen. Yeah. Yeah, and Zombie Side is probably the same, whereas Zombie Dice is just totally a, a, a G-rated, you know, just play it and have a good time. But you know the thing, the thing with even like when you look on boxes and they'll give you like age ratings and stuff like that. A lot of it, speaking just as a parent, it's so you need to know your own kids or your own kid audience that's there. I mean, I know my niece and nephew really ne- well. I know exactly what they can tolerate. Same thing for my kids, and. There are games that they should be totally fine with that I've looked at and thought, I know that kind of stuff spooks them. So even though they're in that age range, that's going to be too much. Um, and then there's other times there's, it'll go the other direction. Well, this game is technically a little old for them, and they'll love it. So there's a lot, and it's hard if you don't know the kids, especially the you know the younger group, however you're old the kids are at a family gathering, whether they're 5 or 14. It's hard to know the kids. So if you don't know them, you're... It's a little tricky. It can be hard because every kid is so very different on what they're willing to take. It's very and I'm going to tell you right now, ignore those age recommendations on the side of the box, especially for independent games, because yeah. a lot of them may be completely and utterly kid-friendly, but they put like age 12 and up or age 14 and up on the box solely because if they go lower than that, they have to pay for safety testing. Mm-hmm. That's true. That In order to market in the United States, which is a very expensive process that most independent gaming companies can't afford yeah. to do. Daryl, do you have anything else you wanted to say about theme? Uh, one thing I might want to talk about is uh, abstractness in the theme. Like, if you're playing something, a lot of people who aren't gamers are going to be drawn in by the theme of the game. So if you get something that's really, really abstract, uh, pulling away from things, zombie dice is a very, very abstract representation of zombies hunting humans. So aside from the fact it's zombies, so you can get away with it, because zombies are always fun, uh, there's a lot of other games that are like that that are that are representing something that's really cool, but it's not going to come across in the game because the game itself is so abstract that you're not seeing the theme in it for a first time player. Like what are some examples? Gamer. The first example that comes to my mind is actually from a game that I would actually highly recommend using, which is Sorrow. Uh, the theme mm-hmm. of that game is you're flying dragons trying to avoid each other, and the game is so simple. It's very quick and easy to set up. It is the box is gorgeous. <laughs> It is beautiful, but the game itself is very, very abstracted from the theme, which if it were actual little miniatures of dragons you're moving around on these paths, that would really attract people a lot more to it than moving around these little stones. Who makes Suro? Uh, I can't is remember it off Calliope? the top of my head. Am I, is it Calliope? I, oh, I might be wrong. So. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Oh, yes. Okay. And Nicole, did yes. you have anything else you wanted to say about theme? No, I think I, I I agree with everything that you guys have all said about it. I think we've we've covered it pretty well. Okay, well, I guess you know another good question to talk about would be what are some? Of, I mean, we've talked about we've mentioned a few names here and there, but what are some of your favorite games uh, to play with your family? I was just looking at these stacks of games behind me before we started to record. One of the ones that we love to play with the family, and it doesn't matter whether it's the kids or the grownups, is um, and it's an easy game. It's Survive: Escape from Atlantis. Oh, yeah, which, which there's an excellent review of that on the D6 Generation, yeah, I might add. Is there? See, I didn't even know that. Uh, <laughs> who are those D6G guys again? Really? I should listen to them more. Uh, that's that's one of our favorite great games to break out, and it's it's easy to teach, and it's fun for the kids, and it's fun for adults. And the, it's games where you get to mess around with other players, and you can, you know, 
thwart their efforts to complete the game and, and get to the end goal, kids love that because when they can, when they see that one of the adults is about to win and they know that they do something, that adult is doomed. Oh, they so do it. They don't even think twice. And it's fun for them, like, you know, and to have the adults all sit there saying, no, you, you know, you, you took my boat when I needed that boat. And they're gleefully laughing because <laughs> they took your boat. You know, that is probably hands down one of the favorite games that I like to break out with a family. I've got a nice little list here, but one I wanted to bring up was one that we've actually brought up earlier in a roundabout way, which you mentioned werewolf as in the party game werewolf. Yes. I actually prefer a variant of that same sort of uh, hidden traitor going on missions mechanic called resistance. I love resistance. Resistance is awesome. It's also a little bit more cyberpunk dystopian themed, which might be why I'm a little bit more attracted to it. But <laughs> uh, the basic... But it's a really great game for if you have a large group of people because it plays with five to ten players. So you can get everyone around the table. The only real downside to it is because it's a really acu accusatory game, you're trying to find the traitor in your midst. That might raise some tensions if they exist in your family. So it m judge on your own case on that one. But Resistance is a blast to play because if everyone can take it as a game, and have fun with it because everyone runs around trying to figure out who the traitor is. Accusations flying wild. There's a lot of social interaction in that game. And it's just a lot of fun. And it's really, if you, if you play just the basic game and you don't get those little extra cards involved, it's really simple to learn and it plays fairly quickly. Awesome. Well, if I had to pick... And the only times Resistance runs along is when everyone spends 30 minutes debating whether or not this mission should pass or fail, in which case everyone's screaming at each other anyway, so they're not noticing they're taking half an hour on a turn. So. Yeah. Well, the, the game I'm going to pick, if I have, absolutely just need to pick one, and I guess we could take turns. The game I'm going to pick now actually is, is really close to the brink on some of the things we've talked about. It's, it's actually a PG-13 game, and it is mostly oriented towards the geekier side of the spectrum, and it has a setup time that is not it's set up time that is more than 30 seconds, uh, but it does play really, really well, and I, I think a lot of people uh, enjoy it. I, I certainly do, and I think it's a great party game because of that. I'm going to say Red Dragon Inn. Hmm. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. I am familiar very, with very it. Very, very vaguely. Yeah, what he said. So Red Dragon Inn is a game where you basically take on the role of fantasy adventurers who have retired to the tavern after a successful dungeon crawl, and you are trying to see who, who will get drunk. The fastest. Whoever, whoever, whoever gets drunk the fastest loses. Everyone else wins. Um, and so you have one guy who's like the priestess, and one guy who's the wizard, and one guy who's the barbarian, and one guy who's the thief. And they each have cards that let them, you know, sort of increase other people's drunkenness or reduce their own. Or, you know, there's, there's lots of different effects in the game. And you have little counters that track your, your drunkenness in front of you on a little game card, uh, which is very cool. And it's just it's just a lot of fun because the artwork uh, is is fantastic. The uh, the theme and and the jokes that they put in there are great. If you're into if you're a geek and you know you know some of the some of the tropes of Dungeons and Dragons, it is it is just a, a hoot. Um, but like I said, it's it's got a lot of things that are strikes against it actually because it is a little more PG thirteen. It is a little more you know setup intensive. So uh, the first, it's funny that the first thing that came to my mind was actually something that was, you know, right on the brink of, of the, uh, the limits we discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, <laughs> although, you know what, my, my, some of my family would get a kick out of that. But yeah, let's see how fast the kids can get drunk. I don't know if that would play really well. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's PG-13 for real. <laughs> that reminded me of one that really is good that I didn't think of before the show for some reason. Uh, it's Gloom. Oh, yeah. Gloom, Gloom is an amazing game. It is it is very the, the way I always describe it to people is Adam's Family the card game because it is very very dark but it's very light hearted at the same time because the whole point of the game is to make your uh, make your family as depressed and sad as possible before killing them off but the artwork is straight out Charles Adams style artwork so it adds a bit of levity to that darkness to the game and the cards themselves because they're like transparent it's really eye catching and it gives you a chance to tell these stories with each other and laugh uproariously as your as you your cousin's uh, 
cousin's little teddy bear with a brain inside of it gets eaten by rats. You know, we play that game at Halloween all the time. That's when that, that somehow that's when we break it out. And it's a fun game all the time, but to me it's my Halloween game. I do love the cards, that whole transparent thing and how everything stacks on each other. That's a fun game. I hadn't thought of that one in a little while. So, Nicole, do you have a second recommendation? A second one, um, I would say Alhambra. Mm. Uh, that game, because now it's not, I guess if for very young kids, it would be a little hard for them probably to, to, to grasp that, you know, to think about that and, and sort of strategize the things you need to think about as you build your little tiles and, and connect your little cities. But it's a fun game. I played that with, I found that it works well, like with that, 11, 12, 13 year old crowd. They're totally into the game, but it has a neat way of bringing in real hardcore gamers, you know, the gamer gamers who think about every last thing that they do and they're thinking 10 steps ahead of where they are right now. Those guys, along with people who don't really consider themselves gamers at all, like my mom, not a gamer. She loves that game. Hmm. So, but she'll play it along with me and Russ and other people in the family who are much more gamers and who are really thinking ahead. And she always wins too. She beats us a lot of that. So <laughs> they, there's something. All, the the non gamers always get into this like Zen mode where you're sitting there planning out every single little purchase, and they just come in in three seconds, move, move, move. Where the hell did that come yeah, from? Yeah, that's kind of what she does. And she's not a gamer. Theoretically, she should not be able to beat all of us, but most of the time she does. <laughs> it happens every time, I swear. Yep. Uh, let's see. If I picked a second one, I would go for something like, um, well, you know, I worked for Fantasy Flight for several years. No. And I got to know their uh, their library pretty well. And there's a game that they have that I thought was really fun, for, especially for uh, groups of kids. Uh, it's a storytelling game, and it's called I, Dark Overlord. I don't know this game. So in I, Dark Overlord, you basically have someone who takes on the role of the Overlord, and everyone else are his minions. And the idea is that the minions have failed in their latest mission for the Overlord, and they have to explain why they failed, as in they have to give an excuse. And then you draw cards from the deck that have little story elements on them, and you have to weave them into the story you're telling to try and shift the blame away from you. Nice. So you're saying, oh, well, your plan was so clever, my lord, except it failed because a flips card, Rosebush flips card, <laughs> and a princess, you know, <laughs> and you just go on from there, right? I think it's great because kids use their imagination, and the idea of a, of a minion, you know, explaining his way out of punishment uh, should be fairly resonant with a lot of kids, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no. See, what had, had happened was... <laughs> let me explain this, Mom. All right, let me take a seat for a minute. <laughs> now, the downsides to I, Dark Overlord, Overlord is that it, there really is no depth to it. It is just basically a storytelling game. So people who want to play a game for the gameplay, you know, for the mechanics and, and sort of getting into the... Uh, all the possibilities of a game are, are going to be disappointed by that. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, I think it'd be a fun time to do, but it's not something we would want to uh, do a repeat of. You know, we'll play it and then we'll put it away till next holiday. Right. Well, and games like that are really fun for and, and kids. You know, they have such vivid imaginations. Anything that lets them come up with a story uh, and make stuff up as part of a game, even if you're not someone, I found even if you're not, into games like that you know if you are the person that wants to have rules and numbers and a way to win like that and it, it, that it's you know sort of figure out 10 steps ahead it's such a kick listening to kids work games like that and work their crazy imaginations that you get into the game just listening to them yeah i mean it can be a super great time with the right group of kids absolutely you know another one I like, and I like it for very specific reasons, is um, Super Dungeon Explorer. Yes. <laughs> oh. I, I love that game because, oh, there's so many reasons. The, the figures are cute. The game is cute. And it's the best way to get kids or people who are board game people into the concept of doing a role-playing game. Because you're, you're doing a dungeon crawl. Well, let's now, let's imagine the dungeon crawl without the little people. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a gateway to RPGs. That's how I look at it. <laughs> you know, and it is a very cool game. I, I, it's one I wish I had a copy of. I look at it and say to myself, that is awesome. It is. It's a fun game. And, and it's everybody we've broken that out with. They've loved it from young kids. I want to say the youngest we had messing around with that. And we'll tweak the rules. Like we're not afraid to like take a game that we know the rules are supposed, something's supposed to be more complicated and say, let's just forget that rule with this crowd. Let's play it this way. Um, we played it with kids as young as like six or seven and then on up to 
I'm pretty sure grandparents have played that one. So you can make it work for anybody, which is hard to do with a lot of games. It's also a gateway drug to the miniature game uh, in mindset, I, I isn't was gonna, it? I was going to say, Ross, you might want to be careful buying that one because it's got a lot of components, as I understand. And you play miniature games. I don't know if you'll be able to take leaving those unpainted. Well, no, probably not. But I think that's I think that's where Nicole's actually heading with this is that the figures are so you know fun in terms of like the way they look for kids. I bet you could get your kids to paint. It, or or sit and watch you paint, if nothing well, else. It is possible that our figures are actually now painted. Yay! <laughs> um, some of them by the husband and some of them by the kiddos uh, because they they wanted to paint them because they've watched him paint them. In fact, the room I'm in smells vaguely of primer right now because painting is happening. <laughs> so <laughs> if I sound a little woozy, that would be the excuse. Um, <laughs> the fumes. Uh, so they see him painting. They looked at them and they're like, "These? why aren't these painted? Can I paint these? That was one of their first thoughts. So ours are now painted. <laughs> so it, it is a gateway drug to, to miniature gaming, I mm-hmm. would say. It's the ultimate gateway to other games. <laughs> Well, that's a that's a really ringing endorsement for it. Now, I think the only downside to it is that I can think of right off the top of my head is it does have a very high buy-in cost. It's a hundred dollars. Yeah, it's pricey. Which you know, and the thing of it being pricey, if you're a guy who's only bought Monopoly at the local you know mega toy right. store, you're gonna freak out. But if you're someone who's a gamer, when you look at it. It's actually not that bad. You know, when you think about little figures and things like that and the components that you're getting, it's not a crazy price point. It's well, I I don't I it's don't disagree, I don't disagree with you, but I I just want to th- say that, you know, in my opinion, I think that's on the high end. Oh yes, absolutely on the high end. I mean, it's absolutely one of those you, you just go on a random whim drop right. 100 bucks on a game or at least I don't think most of us do. Um, actually I take that back. Russ totally does all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say dep- it depends on how much bourbon I've had that yeah, night. Yeah, exactly. But uh, it's when you, if you, in just terms of looking at it as a gamer, if you evaluate the game, it's actually a reasonable price for all the stuff that you get in there. Oh, I'm yeah. I, I actually, absolutely. it's a little bit on the cheap side for all the components, from what I understand. Yeah, I think it's packed. there's a ton uh, of stuff, but you're still, you're still, like you said, Ross, you're still laying out a hundred dollars to get all that stuff. So you, it is one of those you see and you think, I, I really hope I like this because I'm spending a hundred bucks, you know. You know? Well, I'm just saying the, the the games we've talked about so far, like I do, our Dark Overlord and so forth, they, they've been in the twenty to forty dollar range, mm-hmm. you know. And and so I just wanted to point out we are talking about a fairly significant bump in price as, yes. as compared to the other things we were talking about. Um, I'm surprised no one's mentioned Munchkin besides just the brief mention that uh, that Daryl gave it because Munchkin is a good family game uh, for the most part. Like I said, for for, for that one, you'd w- probably want to pick up one of the not Munchkin core. But one of the other ones, like the Pirates or the Zombies right. or the Space or something like that, because it is a more universally accessible theme than a bunch of... My family's not going to get the Dread Gazebo joke. Well, sure, but the thing, that's, one of the be- that's one of the benefits of Munchkin, is that you have so many things to choose from. You know, you, it isn't just, just the one thing. And it's fast playing, and it's very quick setup time, and you know, the, the, it's got a manageable number of components. I mean, I, I think Munchkin hits a lot of those, those uh, sweet spots that we were talking about. Yeah, we've done the the pirate munchkin is the one that we, I think we have more than one, but that's the one that seems to get broken out and played. Um, and we brought that one to family and just, you know, friend get togethers. And that one goes over well, because like you were saying, they're all people get pirates. You know, there's no, there aren't jokes there that most people don't get. So, Well, I think uh, are, if there's nothing else we want to talk about briefly I, or I, go ahead. I wanted to bring up another, another game that's kind of a, it's another one of those gateway to role playing game sort of games, uh, Fiasco. Mm. This one's another. This one's another one you may want to break out after the kids have gone to bed, depending on how mature the audience is. But it's all about acting and t- storytelling. So at the end of the night, after everyone's had a bottle of wine or so, or <laughs> a, a couple bottle? of beers, and the kids and the kids have gone to bed, and all that's happened, then it's a good game to break out and tell a nice, tell a fun story. Especially if you've got family that's friends of like Co- uh, Coen Brothers movies, which the game is based on and it's also a really good introduction to role playing in terms of getting into character and actually acting out your character yeah i've really wanted to try fiasco for a long time i've heard a lot of good things about it it's basically just very very few rules all it is is the rules are setting up the plot and from that point on it's basically improv acting for the most part okay so we we did talk a little bit about cons early on but is there some pitfalls that we need to be watch out for when we're 
when we're introducing our family to, to gaming? Is there some things that we want to be aware of that are going to be like common objections or common issues that or challenges even that might come up? Getting people to the table sometimes. Yeah. And uh, if it's a, it's a, if it's a family that's not gamers, uh, you get the adults say, oh, this is kid stuff. I'm going to play a stupid board game. Like I said, the best way to do that is to pick uh, pick a game that has a theme that would appeal to them and that's visually striking enough to draw them in. They may not jump in on the first game, but if they see everyone playing the game, they'll kind of look over the shoulder and say, oh, what's this? And then they'll get interested and say, oh, can I, can I have next? Yeah, and you know what we tend to do when you're saying how people, you know, that, that idea that uh, games are for kids or no, I don't play that stuff. I'm not interested. Most people at some point, no matter what their age, have played games. You know, like when people used to get together and play bridge all the time. It's a card game, but are, like my parents used to play that all the time. So when she says she never games, I'm like, yes, you did. You just played different games. Try something new and show her a board game. But when we get together for these family things, we have a trunk at Thanksgiving that has pumpkin pie, sweet potatoes, and at least five or six different games in there. So we can bring all these games inside, kind of put them out there and say, like even just looking at the covers, there's things people, for whatever reason, they're drawn to the look of that one or that one, and people can see it before you even start and kind of get a feel for it. And if there's some game you think is going to hit, but everyone's looking at it like, I don't like that, okay, push that one aside. Uh, so it gives people some options, so don't feel also like, I must play this thing. And I think, you know, there are some families out there that have people in them, and this is just because people are people, but there's always, you know, families generally have at least one or two people that are very competitive, when they play. And that can be because they're immature, they're young, you know, it can be for a number of reasons, but you can always have somebody who's just really super, super competitive as a, as an issue or a challenge that you might want to, to be aware of. And what are some ways to address that? Well, I think when you have competitive people when they're, it's, it's, it can be really tough when it's an adult who loses sight of the fact that they're not playing with their buddies. <laughs> yeah. It's like, these yeah. are not the boys on, on a Saturday night. This is your this is your grandma, and this is your aunt, and this is your niece who's only seven. Ease up, dude. So <laughs> it, it, can be, it can be a challenge. But I think, you know, in those circumstances, you almost have to take those people down a peg a little bit when they get too intense and, and almost say something like that to them. Like, dude, she's only seven. Cut her some slack. And, you know, and then that makes Dude, most... in your face, Cindy Lou. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you have to make them kind of realize, like, oh, God, she is she is only seven. And I just, you know, practically table flipped in my anger, you know. So, um, yeah. So, so you sometimes have to call people out when they get too intense with a family like that. Well, Aren't there some games, though, that are cooperative in nature? Like um... That's what I was just going to say. Cooperative games, uh, yeah. Pandemic, Castle Panic, there things like that, where you're, you're working at a, you're not, you're not working, you're working together towards something. Uh, in that case, you might run into the sort of alpha gamer thing happening, but I think that might be lesser of a problem if you've got a group, if you've got people in your family that you know Hmm. aren't going to play nice together. Hmm. So, so pandemic. Hmm. We should do a review of that sometime, don't you think, <laughs> Daryl? That that's one that I was actually thinking about putting on my list for this until I thought about. Wait a minute. That's a really dark tone. <laughs> that is a, and it's also kind a little bit on the complex side in terms of mechanics. Not because the mechanics are really easy to grasp once you get them. But it's a lot of them are just so completely off the wall from what a lot of people are used to in games that it can be daunting. And of course, there's the high difficulty. Right. Well, there's factor it's a it's a difficult game to review as well. And I'm making an inside joke for Nicole's benefit for the D6 generation. So <laughs> they're somewhat infamous for having not reviewed. Pandemic. What's, I've never heard of this. What's this pandemic you speak of? Um. <laughs> so, so th that that all aside, have you seen any other issues that may crop up uh, when you're trying to introduce your family to game? Um, I I don't. I think one of the issues that we sometimes come up with too is. And this happens with younger players, but younger doesn't have to mean really little kid. It could mean a 16-year-old that doesn't play games a lot. Is the idea of sportsmanship, like well oh. and truly sportsmanship. No, that's a really good In point. In your face, Cindy Lou. Exactly. And when adults do it, it's bad. But when kids are doing it, it's 
almost more difficult because you almost you don't know when to overstep when you've overstepped like i can mm -hmm. say to my kids they're not playing the right way like they know sportsmanship and if they're not being good sports i can call them on it but when do you call your niece or your your cousin second you know your second cousin's kids aunts daughters you know where do you draw the line when you can say something to someone um and it can be a challenge when someone's not being a good sport but as a parent, for me, it always sort of gives an opportunity for me to say to my kids afterwards, do you see how so-and-so did that? You don't want to do that. You know how you felt. Don't do that. <laughs> and that includes things like cheating and, you know, just, just generally unfair play. Right. That, that sort of, oh, yeah, I remembered this rule that I forgot, but now I remember because it benefits me. And I didn't mm. remember when it benefited you. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like playing Battleship where they're moving the ships around. <laughs> oh, who isn't guilty of having done that at least once? <laughs> yes, but I made the sound effects when I moved them. Oh, you did? So they so knew I was moving them. I'm cheating. <laughs> 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 okay, well, so Nicole and Daryl, what makes a good gateway game? I think a good gateway game is one that is just it's not too complex so it's not intimidating and it has a theme that whoever you're trying to drag into gaming is really going to be drawn to it has to be the right theme well i would say that's especially important for things like uh, tabletop role-playing games that theme is is just absolute key and we talked about you know early on in the episode we talked about things like you know werewolf the apocalypse which is just oh man that is a theme that i would not want to spring on a new gamer <laughs> no that at all that would not work for a lot of new gamers we we try to stay yeah. with uh i would never even have my kids look at that one my kids are not spooky they don't like spooky stuff so even if i made those rules easier i could never get that in as a gateway game for right them. they'd run right so but we're talking about Gateway. So we're talking about people who are not gamers to begin with, generally speaking, or at least not tabletop gamers. Pretty much hit the nail on the head. You want to have something with a very, very strong theme, but you also want to make sure that it's something with rules they're easily going to grasp for a role-playing game, especially. Uh, that's why I really like a lot of the rules light or almost rules absent games that have been coming out recently. Uh, we already talked about Fiasco as a way to introduce them to getting into a character and acting out. Uh, we talked about the different uh, dungeon crawly board games. Uh, we mentioned Descent, which doesn't really work for a uh, family holiday game night, but is a great way to introduce someone into role playing games. It's a game that really draws you in. You get attached to your character, your character progresses and gets better. You can also look at uh, games like uh, Fate and Fate Accelerated, which are have rules that are very, very easy to pick up. It's very fast-paced. So you really want something that has those sort of really light rules that are easy to understand. You don't want the rules to get in the way of storytelling, which is why people are going to want to start playing role-playing games in the first place. That's true, but I think, you know, we're, we're again in one of those situations where your mileage may vary, right? Because I, I want to tell a quick story. When I got my dad into gaming for the first time, we actually played an RPG called Torg. And Torg is not a rules light game. <laughs> and Torg does not have a light theme. But my dad is extremely you know, well-read science fiction fan, extremely well-read fantasy fan. The, one of the guys who created Torg was actually running a game for us. So in those particular circumstances, I think you know, Torg was an excellent choice for one of my dad's first games. But I have to admit that if I had thought about it far in advance, I probably would have said it was not ideal for the reasons that you just mentioned. Yeah, and you can pull off a more rules-complicated game if you go slowly with it. Uh, that's the way I typically approach even, because right after... I got most of my D&D &D players from my 4th edition game in Austin pretty much right after the Community episode aired, <laughs> because every hipster in Austin saw the Dungeons & Dragons episode of Community, and all of a sudden, hey, D&D is cool, we need to play D&D. &D. And it... Was it advanced? <laughs> <laughs> they actually cut a scene from the end of that episode where it was going to be explained that... Uh, Pierce played D and D over with Gary Gygax at the Playboy Mansion with Hugh Hefner and a bunch of other celebrities, because it was at a time when it didn't have the stigma of being for losers or nerds or for uh, being demonic or anything like that. It was just something that you did to have fun, like any other game. There was a time when you just did it for fun. I can't even imagine there was a time before <laughs> they made it the Satan nerd game. <laughs> Oh, well, I was born in '80, geez. so yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. No, that's 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 interesting information. Um, but yeah, when I when I got that uh, that new all those new players coming into D&D, what I did was I handed them the character sheet, 
And I told them, okay, here's your race. Here's your class. This is what your race is like in this setting. This is what your class kind of does. Don't worry about the numbers. I'll explain them to you when they're relevant. And then just went. And I explained the idea of, okay, now we're going to roll a skill check. Roll the 20-sided die in front of you. That's the one with the most sides. And then add this number on your character sheet to it. And just go through it step by step. If you get something that's really rules heavy, you can bring even the most not big gamer or not big rules type person into it as long as you go slowly and spoon feed them the information they need and feel free to gloss over stuff to get to the point of the story and kind of drawing them in i think you said something really important there you said explain the rules when they're relevant there's so much to rpgs that if you try to explain all the ins and outs and permutations and combinations that a player can have, their eyes are going to glaze over and they're going to lose you because it just makes it so complex. So as you explain those things just when they happen, like you said, don't worry about that. all those numbers. Don't worry about all that stuff. When it matters, we'll take a second. I'll explain it to you. And you give them to them in small little doses along the way, and it's much easier to tolerate and much easier to understand and put all the pieces together. And they can also see it in context. When you're sitting there explaining, okay, this is what your armor class does. It helps you, protect you from attacks. And this is what your saving throw does. If you're trying to dodge something, I think you're just feeding them all the stuff. And they're like, okay, I have no clue what this means because I have no idea what you're talking about. What, what, what I want to need to know what a saving throw is or why I would need to know this. But if you explain it to them when it comes up, it's like, okay, the dragon just breathed fire on you. What you're going to do is roll your reflex save to try to dodge out of the way of the breath weapon. They say, oh, okay, that's what a reflex save is for. It's to avoid something by dodging right. out of the way. Right. It makes a lot more sense. Exactly. They can see it in the context of the rules of the story, and they know why that rule is there, and it helps out a lot. Now, I think it would just be a crying shame if we brought Nicole Wakeland on our show tonight and we didn't ask her to tell us the story of how she got her family into role playing because she has a really cool she has a really cool story to tell about getting her family uh, into the role playing game arena. Oh, is, Isn't that right? Is there a specific story I told once that now I'm supposed to remember, <laughs> Ross? That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I do a lot of for G6G. What did I say? Um, well, we got to... Well, do you, do you or do you not have a story? <laughs> I have a story. I don't know if it's the one you're thinking of, but I've got a story. Let me tell you the okay. story, boys. The story, the, the game that actually we, we got our kids into role-playing games with two different games, um, and one of them is called Fairy's Tale. I don't know if that's the one. Is this the story you're thinking of, Ross? Well, I, I, to be clear, I just any whichever story you felt was was the most important is, is the best one you tell. <laughs> okay, so but you're the you're the person who knows this from firsthand experience, and I do not. So therefore, I'm going to leave it in your hands. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Fairy's Tale, which is a downloadable game, you go to Drive Through RPG and you can get it there, and it's a cheapie. It's like ten bucks or something. And we got this game and. Russ is really excited to teach the kids how to play this. He's like, okay, we're going to play. The first day, all they did was make characters. And they made characters, and they drew little sheets, and they drew little pictures. And they drew pictures of their clothes, and they drew pictures of their weapons, and they drew pictures of their hats, and they drew pictures of their houses. <laughs> then it was like, this is the acorn that I fashioned into a hat. This is where I found the acorn. This is the house the acorn from. This is the tree the acorn grew from. And you're like, oh, my gosh. And there was a point where I thought, I should really, we should rein in this character creation stuff. And I thought, no, if this is what they latch on to, then... That's what they latch on to. And it became a huge thing. They have the prettiest character sheets for a game that I've ever seen. <laughs> and they add to them. Like every game that happens, some character, some something happens. Like, well, now I have to add in that ladybug that we saw down by the river. And the ladybug gets added into a corner of the character sheet. So, <laughs> so it's like the whole story keeps fleshing out. And as it gets bigger and bigger. So I think what we kind of learned trying to get them into games and to show kids getting into role-playing games is they might take you in a direction that you didn't think they would really be interested in and you really weren't expecting at all. And your impulse is, well, I got to show them the other stuff, whatever that other stuff might be. But then just step back. Well, if this is where they're, they're drawn in, let them go with it. Let them go until they're ready to move to the next thing. And yeah, that was what got us got them started as fairy's tale. And also we played mouse guard, which was the same way. We have drawings of mice and their houses and their pets and their tools that they use to cook dinner and everything else because the kids really like 
they they're really attached to their characters and they want to make every last piece of those characters come to life. That is an excellent story, and I'm glad you told us that because <laughs> just the idea, the the thought of them sitting there and making their character sheets with all those really intricate details is actually, I mean, I have a grin from ear to ear right now. That that's <laughs> that is a brilliant story. <laughs> And you brought up a game that I think is is a really good intro game uh, for families, which is Mouse Guard. And uh, now I do, I'm not familiar with Fairy's Tale, but it it sounds like it would be good as well. But the reason why I think Mouse Guard is um, is really good for a family game is it hits a lot of the sweet spots we've talked about as far as complexity and theme. And I think even more than that, I think Mouse Guard has a really cool almost philosophy behind it because the adventuring paradigm, the reason why you're out doing things as mice is very very cool and it, it, it goes to this this philosophy that the mice have that uh, it is not what you fight but what you fight for isn't, isn't that right yeah it's not just a sort of you know you're battling to win the gold kind of of game it's you know you're you're fighting to sort of save a way of life and save people from a greater evil sort of thing and it's and the way the the mice even interact you know it's not like all the creatures in the world are are good you know there's there's regular earthly creatures that don't have any special powers or anything but some of them are evil and they have to stay away from them and some of them are good and they'll help you and some of them are frightened and you have to draw them out to make them work with you and right. it it really is a well thought out universe and I, I tend to think when you think of something small, especially if you're drawing in younger players, the fact that you're playing these wee little mice who do these amazing things, kids can relate to that because kids are small and they like to think that they can do amazing things. And the mice are, become very relatable little characters for them. Yeah, and, and I like the fact that it's it's introducing some of these more broader, more, you know, more epic, I guess, in some ways, concepts in a way that kids can really grasp and get behind. Yeah, we have, um, you know, the, the kids have been playing, I think they have two different campaigns, two, maybe three, it could be more, because they played this game. They started playing, it was just me and Russ and the girls, then their cousins wanted to play. So we had another game that we're running with their cousins. And that's what different story. And then we have another game that we're running with some other friends who happen to be over who, oh, you got to play this game. They've got character sheets too. And, you know, they've got this, they have all these different little worlds that they created and they keep track of every single one of them. They don't get them mixed up. They don't get anything crossed over. They have all these different adventures and it's bringing in all these different people into role-playing games just from us trying it with our two kids, which is fantastic. Yeah, and and I you know I don't want to spend the whole episode talking about Mouse Guard, but it does have some really cool narrative prompts to encourage people to role play in character and to sort of give them a hook or or a an element that they can riff off of in almost any situation. And what I'm talking about is um, every character in Mouse Guard has uh, an instinct, which is you say when this happens, I do this. Right. Right. And then they have a goal, isn't that right? They do, and so I think one of the kid, one of the girls, she was afraid. Her thing is that she's afraid, and her she always wants to run from everything, and so that's her. Her character is always nervous and is always running the background, but she decided she wanted it to be that not only is she afraid, she's trying to overcome that every time. So she'll do these things that allow her to be afraid. Well, she's going to try and do this, but she's really afraid, so she's not going to do it very well. She's going to try and hit that guy, but she's kind of closing her eyes and sideways trying to stab at the bad thing. And it's like she really gets into this idea of, you know, I want to do this. This is what I'm tra- I am I do, but I'm going to break away from that, and I'm going to do the right thing. And I love to see them right. do that. I love that do the right thing kind of thing that they've all developed. And, and that's why I think... Mouse Guard excels is because you, a lot of role-playing games, I mean, every role-playing game to some extent, kind of gives you that full freedom to express your character the way you want to. But I think for kids, it's good to have some structure. It's good to have some prompts that give them an idea of what, what to do next because you know, we as adults, we have years and years of experiences that we can say, okay, well, that's how I would act you know, under these circumstances or, or this character reminds me of someone else that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, but a kid's not going to be that way and they're going to need they're going to need, I think, that support structure. Or I'm not saying this right because they don't need the support structure, but it helps them mm-hmm. to have that support structure. It gives them more. It gives them more opportunities to do awesome things in the game. Yeah, in and my opinion, they really and they really do take advantage of it. I find that the kids just they just thrive, and the things that they do in that game always impress me. And that they do things that I would think would be 
something that they wouldn't wouldn't occur to them you know i look at the kids and i say okay you're nine years old this is all you're going to come up with and they came up with something that i would attribute to a much older player coming up with that solution because they've really mm. thought about their character and they know the character so well um, and get so vested in it so it's yeah it's been amazing watching them play these games and they dm games now which is even more amazing to <laughs> me. <laughs> oh man you know I, my, one of my friends monty actually has a daughter who's nine years old and she is just smart as a whip and i would love to see her dm a game someday and just sort of use the imagination that she's got uh in that way because i think it would be a real interesting experience well you know the first game rose was a 10 when she dm'd her first game and I'll be honest, I thought, oh gosh, this is going to be rough. Like, I was nervous about it because she's, she's making the story up and it's me and Russ and, and our other daughter playing and I'm thinking, okay, I hope we do enough what she expects, that she's ready to handle whatever it is we do. We don't mess her up so she can't figure out where to go. She covered everything we did. She was breaking out character voices for random characters she was wow. inventing. And she, there was this like hag character. And she actually is like hunched over at the table going, oh, this is what you must do. And I'm like, oh, wow. full on got into it. And I'm like, all right, she's got this whole DM thing down. <laughs> you were proud, Mom. You were just filled with I pride. Was. That I was, I was beaming. You? I'm like, that's my child, the hag, right there. <laughs> <laughs> So, Daryl, why don't you tell us, I mean, we've talked about this in Episode Zero a little bit, but if you can remember back to your very first introduction to RPGs and maybe tell us a little bit more about that. My first introduction to role-playing games came through Choose Your Own Adventure books. That was pretty much the first thing I had where it was in second person. You do this, you do that. And I was the character in the story. I was used to reading stories. My mom... I've said this before, I literally grew up in a bookstore. My mother owned a bookstore from when I was five years old. So I was reading constantly. This was the first time I was the character in the book, and it just hit all these buttons. And I died constantly, <laughs> and I hated that part. But I was also I was, I was also the kid who had like all four fingers marking different places. Like, oh, I screwed up. Let me go back to this one. I remember doing that so you could undo your but, choice. I'm like, oh, I don't like page 42. I want to go to page 32 instead. <laughs> exactly. But uh, it, the moment that role playing came into it was middle school, fifth grade. My friend got me hooked on it because he had gotten hooked on BattleTech, but he had gotten hooked on it in this weird roundabout way as a role playing game instead of as a tabletop miniatures game. So he had the games, but he just didn't play them. He had played this role playing game scenario with him, and it wasn't even really a role playing game per se. It was more like a verbal choose your own adventure. He had. A scenario that his friend had run him through and so he ran me through it and it was no dice no real rules or anything it was just him describing the setting him describing what the characters did and me saying what i did and how that affected everything and it just it was a really cool little story i still remember all the little story beats that were in it and it was really awesome and it hooked me and the world hooked me and i just dug in and then that led me to shadowrun which was my first real full-on role-playing game yeah it was just that that idea of being reading all these stories all this time when i was growing up video games were legend of zelda and super mario brothers which are amazing games but you don't necessarily feel the graphics were so i don't want to say bad because they were really really good for that era for the apid era but looking at those games you didn't you never felt like you were the character and you were controlling yeah. this other character in this you were the character inside this story and that whole concept to me just blew my mind and opened up so many doors for me. You know, this, I'm, I'm almost the same exact way, Daryl, because my dad started me out reading fantasy at a very young age. Um, I read a ton of books, and I, I really got into the idea of characters doing cool, heroic things. Um, but he brought home one day the Moldvay Red Box edition of Dungeons and & Dragons. And in the back of that, it has this idea of the Caves of Chaos, and it talks about Bargol, the evil wizard, and Alina, the friendly cleric. You know, and it's your quest to sort of bring Bargle to justice. And along the way, Alina gets killed by Bargle. And your character, that's when, that's when your, your character is given sort of control over the situation. And just like, you know, you said where now you get to be that character. I, I was, you know, reading, I'm only eight years old, right? And I'm reading this, and I'm like, oh no, Alina! And I get, to, uh, I get to the section where it says, now what do you do next? And I'm like, well, I'm going after Bargle. He's going down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and that's, that's when, you know, just like you had your epiphany, that's, that's the same for me, where I was like, man, this is the game where I get to decide 
what happens next. I get to, you know, control the fate of, of this character and change things in this world. It's not just a static story that I'm experiencing. It is an evolving narrative that I am actually taking part in. And uh, that's, that's the part where I said, this is something I want to do really bad, that I want to be a part of really, really bad. The, the kids that I played the first game with, you know, I still really wasn't sure how it were, all worked, so we, we met some guys in a tavern, and they seemed, they seemed untrustworthy to me, so I turned to my friend and said, I don't think we can trust these guys. And the DM says, well, when they hear you say that, they don't look happy. And I'm like, wait, wait, they can hear me talk? <laughs> What do, you, what do you mean they can hear me talk? <laughs> you know, I hadn't fully grasped that I was, you know, quite fully there. And then once, you know, once he had people react to me, yeah, it just, it just completely, you know, as you say, blew your mind. Yeah, that's, that was the moment. So, I mean, for me, I, for, for Daryl, you had a very unusual introduction. Um, um, Choose Your Adventure is, is a good gateway, that, that's for sure. But for actual gaming, you had a very unusual introduction, whereas... I think I had a little more of the traditional style, which is through what's these days called a boxed set, or even in some ways a starter box. I, I think you would, I think the three of us would probably agree that the old red box D and D was was very much a starter set. Yeah, that was. So, oh that, yes, that that's what it was meant to be. And that was the first the first time I think it was older than you guys. The first time I actually played an RPG because I did the choose your own adventure books and I loved those things and thought it was so cool being in charge of stuff. But the first actual role playing game I played. I was probably like in high school. I was probably about 17 or I'm probably 17, maybe 18 years old before I played one. Mm. And it was because of Russ. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that devious Mr. That Wakeland. Devious Mr. Wakeland, but give, you know, nerds hope everywhere. He asked me to come play D&D with him and his friends and I married him. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're a unicorn. <laughs> I don't exist. Um, but that was the first time that I ever played the game. And because he used to play with, I was kind of jealous in a way. Like he would play with the guys. They, they had a set, like, I don't know, every second Saturday or something, they'd all get together and spend like a whole night, all of them just playing till the wee hours. And it's like, what is this game? And I didn't want to intrude on their whole, you know, guy man cave kind of thing going on <laughs> you know it's like i don't want to get involved in that but i would love to you know okay he's like you want to play i'm like all oh, right i'll try it and i really liked it but it was the first time i ever played with him and his high school buddies some of whom i still know um and that was it was amazing i'm like oh this is what D D is all about it was it was very cool you know nowadays i think there are more of those box sets that you can find to bring people into gaming with or Maybe not even just the box set, but some games in general just are very good for getting people into role playing and right at the beginning. And we've mentioned a couple of them already. We talked about Fairy's Tale and we talked about Mouse Guard. Um, what are some other great gateway games or sets or products that could get people into a role playing game? I'm going to steal your thunder a little bit, Ross, because I can see on your notes the best beginner's product that I think has ever been put out, the Pathfinder Beginner's Box Set, the black, the black box. That is just the perfect box set. If you have anyone who's even remotely curious about role-playing games, it is the Pathfinder rules, but they're stripped down to a point where it is very easy to learn. It has everything that you need to start running a campaign. It has the rules all the way up to level 5, which will get you a good 3 or 4 months of gaming, even if you're playing weekly. And it has all these little cardboard stand-ups that you can use on this flip mat that they give you. And it's just, it is the most reasonably priced, well-written, well-produced beginner's box set that's out there. Unfortunately, it's out of print right now, but it's coming back in print this, I think, March or May. Now, you did, did you but say it, that it, it is still available online? Does it include miniatures? It doesn't include real miniatures. It has these little cardboard stand-ups, like uh, cardboard pawns. Okay, okay. That you can use. It's like, uh, you punch them out of the cardstock, and it's really thick, durable cardstock, and then it's little stand-up pawns you can stick them in, so you have all the little stand-ups. And of course, you can go buy the Pathfinder Battles miniatures to replace them if you want to. Right. But that's the thing, you don't need to. You can, out of the box, play this game that is, if you're wanting to run combat in Pathfinder, it's really kind of important that you have a grid and little miniatures or tokens of some sort. And it is the best looking and best packaged beginner's box for that style of fantasy role playing that I have ever seen because it has everything you need to run the game for 
months out of just that one box. I, I have to agree with you, and you're right, you did steal my thunder because I was <laughs> going to talk about that, but it is it is an excellent <laughs> product, and it has received you know quite a bit of recognition for for being an excellent product. And I think this is one of, I mean, this is definitely one of the things that Pathfinder has done exceptionally well is craft such a high value and high quality introductory box set. Uh, as as a game in general, I think that that, that really helps uh, helps what what people think of when they think of Pathfinder. That that beginner's box is a is a good example of that. And speaking of choose your own adventures, I believe it actually has one in the box where if you're completely and utterly new to role playing games and you're wanting to figure this out, it's kind of like the same thing that what you were talking about in the red box, but it's more of a choose your own adventure. It is okay. You're starting off as a complete blank slate. Say a goblin is charging towards you. Are you more likely to pull out your sword and attack him, sneak behind him and stab him in the back, or cast a spell at him and that gets you your class? And then you can just keep and you keep moving forward and figure out your race and you start getting items and you actually get experience points at the end so you can carry that character into the actual game itself. But it's a really well written, very it's very simple, very easy to understand, but it's also very fun to run through. I ran through it as a gamer that's been gaming for decades and i still had fun running that little intro adventure that came with it that's just literally a choose your own adventure solo game i will always have a soft spot in my heart for bargle and alina <laughs> I, I just for some reason i i always look back on the caves of chaos and, and that experience and i'm like yeah that was the day you know so <laughs> but no pathfinders yeah. is great and um i'm going to talk about something i think was actually criminally under recognized for uh, its value is the Star Wars Edge of the Empire box set, the beginner game. I, I, I do believe that the only people who underestimated that were the Any Awards Committee. <gasps> Everyone else has loved that game. And I've, I, I you know, one of my most controversial blog posts for this year was actually about the Any's uh, for this year and how they completely ignored <laughs> the Star Wars uh, Edge of the Empire box set for beginners because it is just a beautiful thing in terms of production values. It is a very, really cool adventure. It is a really, really cool uh, way to play Star Wars and get people interested in Star Wars. And it does it It does it does in a way that not all role-playing games do. It, it, it's, it's got a different um, you know, approach with the way that the dice work and you interpret the, the roles in a way that fits the story. So I think... For me, like the Star Wars Edge of the Empire box set is actually something you can use as a beginner set, even for experienced role players, and say, here's here's a new way to to look at how to role play in Star Wars, and that makes it a, a, an exceptionally cool game. And it's it's got a lot of support on the Fantasy Flight Games website with a follow up adventure and additional characters and just just tons of stuff you can do with it, kind of like the the Pathfinder one does. And I again, I think anybody who wants to see a really nice, slickly produced, fantastic-looking game uh, should get a look. Should definitely give it a look. What about you, Nicole? Do you can you think of any uh, intro, intro games that uh, have particularly impressed you? Well, you know what? There's not. It, it's, I don't have a particular game that stands out in my mind that I think is a better intro game than than another. For me, it's a. I always feel like the best intro game is the one that you think you can get your friends to play with you. <laughs> I know that sounds like like funny, like haha. But if you have a game, like if you think that that's Star Wars is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you want to play that game, your friends have no interest in Star Wars. You're getting nowhere with that role playing game. It doesn't matter how good it is, or True. how much you like it. So I kind of feel like the best intro game is the one that when you talk to your friends out of it, about it before you buy the box. They say, hey, yeah, you know, I could get behind that. I'm into whatever that is. I'm into sci-fi. I'm into fantasy. I'm into a space battle. I want to, oh, I'll kill dragons. And you got to find one that you like that you think your friends will play. Because if they're not, especially if you're all sort of new gamers, you know, you don't have any real background doing an RPG. If you don't have people who are willing to jump in on the ride with you, you're, you're never going to get sucked into the, the whole idea of it. True, but if you if if you find people that don't really know or like Star Wars, you're gonna have I think a probably hard time getting them into anything geeky. Yeah, just saying. well, that was just an example. <laughs> I know, really, they're replicants. I know, but <laughs> <laughs> still. <laughs> yes, speaking of Nicole, vampires do not sparkle. Thank you. Okay, we can stay <laughs> friends. <laughs> my, for the record, my anti Twilight rant is three hours long, and I don't even use the word sparkle <laughs> once. I know. There are so very many things to destroy about Twilight. 
Very nice. Yeah. Yes, they do not sparkle. Yes. I've trained they my kids to say that. They don't know anything about like hormones. <laughs> okay, what happens to vampires in the sun? They do not sparkle, mommy. They burst into flame. Excellent. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or they lose their vampiric powers and appear completely human. <laughs> You want to go back to the original Dracula? No. Wow. In my world, they burst into flame. Don't mess with things, Daryl. They burst into flame. <laughs> <laughs> now, Nicole brought up a really great point, though, that your friends have to be into it. And I would say, like, for me, like, a good game for that, that is, like, a generalist sort of, you know, if they don't like this, then I'm not sure what to do kind of game, is Feng Shui. And Feng Shui is a game that is kind of old. Um, it's actually being redone now by uh, Atlas Games, and I'm very excited to see what they do with it. It was originally done by Atlas, so don't get the wrong impression, but uh, it, it has been out of print for a while. And Feng Shui is a game that is an action hero, Asian, Hong Kong action film type game. And that's why I say it's, it's, it's very universal to a lot of people, because if you talk to your gen- you know your typical people on the street, and you say, have you seen... You know, do you know what, I, what I'm talking about when I say Hong Kong action film? Most people will say, oh, yeah. You know, and even, you know, a large percentage of them will say, I like that kind of style of movie. Mm-hmm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Feng Shui is kind of like uh, Big Trouble in Little China, the yes, role-playing game. Yes, it is very similar to that, which uh, you just mentioned, one of my top movies of all time. <laughs> so there you go. But Feng Shui is um, one of those games. It, it also comes with character creation is, like, incredibly simple. Um, I can literally sit down and we can start playing within 10 minutes because you pick an archetype and you maybe change one or two skills and you're ready to go. It's that broad. It's that simple. Um, It's exceptionally good for running at a convention. If you have nothing else to do, just whip out your feng shui game and say, hey, you guys want to play some feng shui? Do anybody in the hallway? And you can get one going. I know this as a fact because I've done it. So, so feng shui. Now, I think, you know, it does miss some of the other marks that we've talked about in the past. Like it is a little more, um, Hong Kong action movie is not something you can get a lot of kids into um, for, for one. And uh, for another, it does still lack some of the depth that people will really get uh, an enjoyment out of from something like Pathfinder. Um, but it is an extremely fun game if you have the right mindset and if you have people that, that enjoy the tropes that it, that it really riffs off of. Particularly film fans, which Daryl will get a kick out of. Like a, you know, Anybody mm-hmm. from Any Cool News will probably just go, oh yeah, absolutely, I am totally there. And uh, you know it has it has a lot of that appeal that I think will, that people will find uh, attractive, but you know the thing is it's never had a starter set. But talking about all these starter sets that we're talking about tonight has made me think that I would love to see some starter sets for games that I can never seem to get anybody to play. Like what? Like which games? Well, there's some games. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one out there. I'm a huge fan of Rifts as far as the setting goes. Mm-hmm. I think I think Rifts is just a fantastic setting. It's just it's got tons and tons and tons of character. It's it's beautiful. And I would love to get people to play Rifts. Now, unfortunately, the system is is very old and clunky um, and very complex and not intuitive at all. So there's, I, I believe the, the, the word I use is obtuse. obtuse. Yeah, well, that, 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 that is part of it. But if there was a Rifts intro box set, you know, I mean, just I'm, I'm kind of riffing on, like, you know, wouldn't it be great if? But if there was, I think I would be able to get more people to play the games that I love the most. And I think that's one of the things that makes a, a, a box set or like a starter set um, so attractive is it is that opportunity for me to, to share the things that I love or find most attractive um, as, as far as, uh, you know, pastimes with people that I want to spend time with. You know, if I want to talk to my best friend and say, hey, you know, you've never gamed with me before, but I think you'd really like Star Wars. You know, that's one of the advantages of that box set really uh, makes it attractive to me is because... Uh, we could get it out. We can start playing. We can get right to the meat of the fun, the meat of the matter, the the heart of the fun of the game in a very short period of time. And I I just wish that this was something you know more universal amongst role playing games and you know more of them that that are out there that I I would like to get people to try, uh, like toward. Well, it it really great. it really is getting that way where a lot of role playing games are coming out with quick start PDFs that you can download from download for yeah. free. A l- free almost- RPG day. Uh, has really free RPG that. day is a big day for it. Even outside of that, you can go to uh, drive through and get all kinds of quick starts. You can just search for free stuff 
on yeah. there, set the price search to zero. You can find all kinds of quick starts and PDFs for games you may have never even heard of before. And when you try them out, it's like, oh, this is kind of cool. Let me get the full game, which is kind of the whole point to the quick start in the first place. But it's just a way to really jump into these games right. with both feet and and be able to still tread water. And, you know, you brought up a really good point because um, Free RPG Day is, is an excellent way to get a hold of these uh, in a physical form. For example, uh, Fantasy Flight Games does one for all of their lines. They do a quick start that you can actually download for free from their website. And I know a lot of companies are doing that this day, these days as well. And that's a good point. Um, I just, you know, I look at my shelf from things back in the 80s, and it seemed like everybody was doing box sets back then. There were, a, you know, there was a Marvel superheroes box set for a, a basic and an advanced, right, for people who wanted to learn how to play Marvel superheroes. There was... Oh, the old face rip system? Yeah, exactly. And... Which you know makes it sound a lot less family friendly than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's just that's just the order the attributes it's, go in. It's, it's a it's shorthand. It's the acronym. Yes, I know. But um, for our listeners' sake, it is that that is a lot less uh, violent. Yeah, than you're not sounds. actually ripping. In- yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and and I think you know there was. Uh, you know, Middle Earth Roleplay had a box set, uh, an intro game. I mean, every, everybody seemed to have one back in the day. I'm glad to see that that is a tradition that is still carried on um, by a lot of publishers. And, you know, I guess that's really all I had to say about that. Wait, I think the idea of having a, a starter set or a quick start or those... I like having something physical. Like, and I think sometimes when you're downloading stuff, it's not quite the same as buying a set and going, this is the starter box. This is the starter set. This is going to get me moving on this. And I think the idea of having something that they label that way as a starter box, it makes it feel like this is the thing I should be buying that will teach me everything I need to know to do this without being so complex. It'll take me five days to understand what's inside of here. There's something, you know, because you see sometimes you said you think I'm never going to understand all those rules. And if it's new to you, it's intimidating as all heck to see all the stuff that you have to figure out. So just calling it a starter set immediately like removes half the intimidation and makes you think, okay, I got this. I can figure this game out. I can play this with my friends. This is something I can handle. And that's important even for games that are a little bit more universal to gaming culture, like, for example, Pathfinder. You look at that Pathfinder core rulebook, it's like 500 pages. Yes. Yeah. That's really intimidating if someone who is brand new to the hobby looks at that and says, I've got to read that mm-hmm. before I can play. You open up the beginner's box, it's a 32-page rulebook, a 64-page rulebook, I believe, and then independent character sheets. Right. Yeah. And it's a lot easier, and it doesn't feel as overwhelming or intimidating. Because those uh, huge books are just awful. If you don't know and you see that huge, thick book, you're thinking, there's no way. No way I'm going to figure out how to do a role-playing game if this is what I have to learn to do it. And then you, you're like, no, check out, you're done. Uh, the hero system has a particular issue with that because the hero <laughs> system is, is exactly these huge, thick, textbook-like <laughs> Books. The two core rule books, I believe, add up to twelve hundred pages. Wow. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, the hero system is 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 fantastic. I am one of the biggest fans of the hero system you'll ever ever meet. But they, it is one of the most nuanced rule yeah. systems out there. It can cover pretty much anything you want to do in a role playing. But one of its weaknesses is that you know it, it, you can do it covers anything yeah. you want to do in a role playing <laughs> game in the rules. You know, very recently they did release kind of a beginner's product, which was called Champions Complete. And it's a much smaller book that is kind of, you know, this is the basics of how to play. And they've tried to address this a few times with uh, a product called the Sidekick, the Hero System Sidekick, and a few other things. But it just, you know, it never really quite managed to click. And I wonder if, you know, part of the problem is when you have something that's so intimidating, so large, you really need to have the whole complete package. You can't just give people a book. You got to give them an adventure. You got to give them the character sheets. You got to give them some dice. You know everything they need to get started. And that's one of the beautiful things about some of the products we talked about, like Star Wars and Pathfinder, and is is that they give you literally every last thing you need. I mean, well, with the possible exception of pencils, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to play the game. And uh, I, I think that's that's a really smart move. Yeah, you need to feel like you've got all your resources there, and they need to feel like a manageable number of resources you know you don't want to have to run around looking for stuff and you don't you just role-playing games if you haven't played them they're so much fun and they're so enjoyable and can bring you and 
people you don't know together and you and your friends together and closer than you were before because you just it's just such a fun thing to share those adventures. But if you're just trying to get the concept of them, they are so intimidating. The whole idea is almost frightening and everyone holds on to that, you know, D&D Satan uh, thing. And there's <laughs> that's niggling in the back of every person's mind when they hear role playing game. And you're like, oh, is this going to be weird? <clears throat> you know, elf star. No, are you going to show? Are you going to show up in costumes? Yeah, and, like, like no, every, no, not black leaf. Are, are you, I don't want to die. And that, are you? Are you <laughs> is this the one where you run around the forest and you pretend things and you hit people with swords? No, no, I don't. And then you climb into the steam tunnels. <laughs> yeah, and... they're all confused, <laughs> so they need it to be simple. <laughs> Well, you know, another place to go to get people, you know, at least into the idea of what games are about is actually, like, film. There's actually quite a few films out there that are a good way to sort of tell people, like, this is what gaming is like. This is where, you know, we get a lot of our ideas. This is kind of some of the tropes that we play with. Um, and there, there's, um, like, a new release, I think, that's... Uh, Zero Charisma. Zero Charisma, for example. Although, you know, sometimes these are... It's, it's, sometimes it's more difficult to get to the... Uh, the parts where you want to show people what it's like through the through all the comedy, um, the gamers is another great film, for example. Yes, I like that one. Um, uh, standard standard action on YouTube. Thaco, you know, there, there's quite a few of these films that are also not a bad place to go if you want to say here's here's you know a little more information in the form of something you can look at. And I think that about brings us to the end of our show because it looks like the barkeep is giving me that last call look. He's ringing the bell. <laughs> Nicole, well, I had go ahead. I had one more quick thing I wanted to bring up. If you're, uh, one of the problems that we mentioned earlier with getting people into the game, uh, into a role playing game, might be the theme. One of my best tactics that I use to try to sort of trick people into playing a game they may not be interested in. For example, this is when there wasn't a, a Firefly role playing game. I had a friend who, eh, Star Wars is okay, but I'm a big Firefly fan. I'm brown coat all the way. I'm like, okay. So I took, in, in this case, it was the D6 uh, uh, Star Wars system, and I just reskinned the crap out of it so that it was Firefly. And it didn't take a lot of finagling to do that, because I was able to draw in the same, take these same rules, and then just kind of, okay, this rule is trying to describe this, let's make it describe this instead. So basically, River Song ended up being a Jedi. <laughs> nice. River, so, River Song? Was this a crossover with Doctor Who? I know, is this a Doctor Seuss crossover? What have you, is this the Doctor Seuss? I mean, uh, Doctor... And- I've, been wa- I've, been watch- I've been watching that damn trailer for the, <laughs> new, for the new special, like, on loop. No spoilers. So, River Tam, River Tam. <laughs> Use the force, Harry, said Gandalf. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great way to kind of introduce people. If they don't, if this is, if you, if the game you're wanting to play isn't something they may not be into, then fudge some stuff and make it into something they would be into, and you can draw them in that way. And even they'll find out that gaming is fun, even if they don't necessarily like that one specific thing. Can you do Mad Men, the role playing game? Only if you have lots of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe that's what Fiasco is for. <laughs> yeah, that would work. Okay, um, so I think we're, like I said, we're, we're at last call. That bell's being rung. The Imperial Guard is, is stopping their head in through the tavern. So I want to ask Nicole to just sort of tell the listeners where they can find her on the web and what her latest thing is that they should be looking for. Uh, let's see, where you can find me. Well, you can. I have a segment on that little D6 Generation gaming podcast. Uh, you can also find me online. I have my own blog called Total Fangirl, and I also write for Nerd Approved and for Geek Mom. And write about cars at the Fast Lane Car. That's my other geek passion. Uh, and what you can look for coming from me, uh, I actually have, you said you're a brown coat. Uh, I have a little Firefly thing coming up from uh, the Echoes of War campaign Ooh. to go with your RPG, which will be coming out. I wrote one of their adventures. So that will be the next big thing coming Very from nice. Yeah. Wow, that is fantastic. Can you tell us anything about it other than it's coming out? Or? Um, it's about Firefly. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> okay, okay. Fair enough. And it's going to be in what product? Um, it's going to be in there. Whether it's not in the main RPG, which comes out in October, uh, February of next year. It's their Echoes of War, which are additional adventures that go along with that RPG. Okay, so be on the lookout for Echoes of War from Margaret Weiss Productions. Mm-hmm. And it'll have an adventure in it by Nicole Wakeland. 
And TotalFangirl.com, is that where we find TotalFangirl.com is my blog where you can find all of the coolest stuff that I do. I rant occasionally about vampires that sparkle just because they tick me <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Nicole, for coming on the show. We really appreciate you telling all your great stories tonight. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. This was very fun. I really enjoyed this. Good time. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we will hopefully bring you on again in the future sometime to talk more about games. Absolutely. That's a good plan. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Gamers Tavern. Please visit our website at gamerstavern.org and feel free to leave us a comment or check out our sponsors to support the show. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or rate and comment on iTunes. Your comments might just be read on the air. We'd like to thank Nicole Wakeland once again for joining us, and be sure to tune in next week where our guest will be the designer of Eberron and Gloom, Keith Baker, as we talk about tips and tricks for GMing. The Gamer's Tavern is licensed under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 license. Until next time, gamers, the tavern is closed. And we're out. All right. And stop. <laughs> There's a giant spider on the floor. Wait. Is there not a giant spider on the to, floor now? That's... There is. I've been trying to. I've been trying to kill it without smacking it hard and making it. Now it's really dead. This is totally going in the show. No, it's not. <laughs> this is totally going in the show. <laughs> I've been staring at this giant spider and I'm like he's just sitting there. I tried to smush him under the trash can. The trash can wasn't heavy enough. But now I threw something at it and it's dead. It was actually a. I, poster that I, I, I was, I was worried for just a moment there. You were going to say that there was a big spider there, but now I can't find it. I'm like, that's worse than a spider oh, no. being there. Dudes, I slowly would have walked away. I'm like, I'm walking away from the podcast. And I have to kill the spider. I can't sleep tonight. I would have so. Wow. All right. Well, good luck with that total spider killing thing. Um, I was trying to be good and not make a loud noise, and I'm just staring at it. Please don't crawl away. <laughs>